Very good. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavidyan Karava Vahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastu Ma Vidvisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarva Bhuta Guhashayam Yat Sarva Vishayati Tam Tasmai Sarva Vide Namaha Very good. Nice to see you all this morning. Welcome also to the students regularly attending this class online. We continue. We actually um, our previous class, we cut a little bit short because we were getting into a very important discussion uh, introduced by this last verse that we saw. We'll pick up the thread in just a moment. I didn't want to break that up into two classes, so it made more sense to uh, finish our class a little early, so this class will be that much more powerful. I think you'll find it, it so as, as we continue. So we had discussed how we're on the right for us. Yeah. Api, yes. Um, <coughs> we had discussed how, actually the, the, uh, a question was raised, how can Brahman be known directly? Remember we've said Brahman is known directly. How can that Brahman be known directly or, or otherwise? observing the fact that Brahman can't be perceived with your five senses. You can't see, hear, taste, touch, or smell, Brahman. And a very interesting point Shankara made is, nor can you perceive Brahman directly with your mind like you can perceive happiness and sadness, right? When happiness and sadness are present in your mind, they're perceived. When a thought is present in your mind, that thought is perceived. Even now in the process of uh, seeing, the image of me arises in your mind and that image is perceived. Um, unlike these examples, Brahman can't be perceived in your mind. And I'm smiling now recalling a, a very common thing that's often written or said and that is, in deep meditation, Brahman will emerge, like shining like a thousand suns. You've read or heard something like that before. Tell me, if that thousand suns experience arises in your mind, it's perceived, right? Who perceives it? <laughs> this is such a common confusion because according in the vision of the ancient rishis, Brahman can only be known as you, the essence of the observer. Brahman is not an object to be known. Brahman is the essence of you, the observer. And we can substitute Atma, since at this level, Atma and Brahman are interchangeable. So, that being so then, how can Brahman be known? And the only instrument we have to use is our mind. It's an instrument of knowledge. Um, as I'm smiling again, remembering uh, my guru, Puja Swamiji's uh, joke, is, is that what do you, if you're using your mind, it's merely intellectual knowledge. He heard this complaint a lot. It's mere intellectual knowledge. And his reply would be, in addition to intellectual knowledge, what other kinds of knowledge are there? And he would always give this one example. Is there such a thing as nasal knowledge? <laughs> so, and, and this turns out not to be a problem at all because as you've understood from many prior classes, the problem is in your mind, the solution is in your mind. 
The problem happens to be self non-recognition, a fancy word of saying ignorance. And if the problem is ignorance in your mind, the solution is knowledge that takes place in your mind. Okay, with regard to that then, um, how the mind can know Brahman is described in this last verse that we saw in the last week's class. So just review the first half of it. And he says that, um, and, and we'll, we'll use the word Atma here, the true self. Atma, consciousness, the one who observes whatever is in the mind. And that definition is so important. If everyone started with that definition, consciousness is that by which everything that happens in your mind is known. If everyone used that definition in their spiritual lives, there would be so much less confusion. Anyway, so he gives two examples of how you can know something that is not directly perceptible. So you can't perceive Atma with the five senses, nor can you perceive Atma in your mind, like happiness and sadness and other mental activities. So he gives two examples. One is viewing Rahu. And we gave a long ex uh, explanation of that in a prior class. We won't revisit all of that, except to say that an eclipse, by seeing an eclipse, you get to know something about the object that is doing the eclipsing. Is there such a thing as an eclipser and eclipsed? We can make up our own language here. So when the uh, light of the sun is eclipsed by the uh, earth, then we can see a shadow on the moon. So you know something about the earth by the shadow on the moon, right? The shadow on the moon is curved. Anyone who says the earth is flat <laughs> has got a, got a big problem there. And the second example he gives is looking into a body of water and seeing the reflection of the moon. You don't see the moon. You only see the reflection. But when you see the reflection in the moon, do you have any doubts about whether or not the moon is up in the sky or not? If it's a new moon, you have no doubt at all. You can see it, but you don't see the moon. You see its reflection. So both of these cases show an indirect way of perceiving. We, we admit Atma cannot be directly perceived. But it doesn't mean that Atma, it, this is a big problem for some people, if Atma can't be directly perceived, then it becomes a matter of belief. Like the Lokas, heaven and hell, like Shiva and Vishnu, like Santa Claus. <laughs> when I was a child growing up, that was a big deal. So, if it can't be perceived, it could be consigned to the category of belief, not at all. So here, Shankara introduces manners in which you can indirectly perceive consciousness, and here's how. And we talked about this at the very end of the class, so this is the beginning now for today's class. How can consciousness be indirectly perceived in your experience right now? So right now, in your mind is an image of me. And as I said in the last class, is that image of me known or unknown? Known. So that image possesses known that's an unusual word. We don't really have it in English. We can make it in English, and it, it makes sense, but it's not a conventional kind of word. It's an important word. The knownness of the image of me in your mind comes from where? 
why and how is that image known? The fact that you see the image in your mind means knownness is present in your experience right now. Two things are present. One is the image of me, and the other is the knownness of the image. Does that work for you? It's a tricky use of language. So there's an image, there's also knownness of the image. Because if either of these two were absent, if the image was present but there was no knownness, <laughs> if knownness is present and there's no image, then you won't see anything. Both of these factors are involved. The image is involved and the knownness of the image is involved. Just check. No problem. Good. So that being so, we go back to that question. Why uh, the image we can explain. In fact, neuroscience can even explain it quite, quite well. Very complicated process in the uh, nerves and brain, and then in your mind arises an image. What about the knownness of that image? That knownness exists. You confirm it right now in your experience. But that knownness is independent of the image. The knownness isn't coming from me outside here, nor is the knownness coming from your mind. Your mind is an object. Your mind is, yeah. Hmm. Actually, this is the next, the next topic. So let's just pause here with that question. Where does that knownness come from? and we'll deal with it in the very next verse. And that will be our, our discussion. Okay. Oh, one comment I made here. I write notes on this one before class. And that is, by observing an effect, you know something about its cause. By observing or eating yogurt, you know something. You can, imp you can figure out that there must have been a cow and milk, otherwise it's yogurt. <laughs> so you can infer something about the cause from the effect. When you see the shadow on the moon, you can infer something about the, the, the shadow as an effect. You can infer something about the cause. When you see the rippling moon in the water, you can infer something about the cause. The rippling moon is an effect. That moon is the cause. And by observing the image of me in your mind right now, which is an effect, you can infer, you can, infer, you can know something about the cause. I just wanted to include that before we continue. So let's continue. Bhanor bimbam yatha chaushnyam, Bhanor bimbam yatha chaushnam, Jale drishtam na cham basaha, Jale drishtam na cham basaha, Buddhao bodho na tad dharmas, Buddhao bodho na tad dharmas, Tataiva the time. <coughs> okay. Now, Shankara continues to investigate this experience, the experience in which everything that happens in your mind possesses knownness. Suppose someone suggests maybe the knownness comes from the mind. In fact, that's kind of what a lot of modern science tries to do. Uh, knownness is a property of the, of the brain or mind. It's some, by the way, they keep coming up with theories, none of which have been proved, most of which are unprovable. What is the point of, a, of, a, of having a theory that can't be proved or disproved? Technically, it's not science. That was a, there was a big argument decades ago about the string theory. Because they, 
the, the, the when they devised string theory, they said it can't be proved, it can't be disproved. Then how is string theory science if it's not available for proof or disproof? So a lot of modern science, I keep saying modern science, it's, it's science is modern. Neuroscience is a cutting edge and they have many theories which are unprovable and therefore non-scientific. That's not our topic right here. But the objection is very much from them. Maybe knownness comes from the mind, from the thoughts, from neurons in your brain. They can't explain how, but they suggest somehow or another knownness arises. And that's what Shankara deals with here. Interesting that in this verse, Shankara unknowingly anticipated this argument of neuroscience that would occur <laughs> how many centuries later? Anyway, look at this. He says, um, suppose you see the panoho um, bimbam. You see the, the uh, bimba, the reflection of banu is the uh, sun. You see the reflection of the sun jale in water. It is drishtam. So when you see drishtam means sin. When you see the reflection of, of the sun in water, Shankara's point here is, is the bimbam, the reflection itself, cha aushnyam, aushnyam is heat. Both the image of the sun and the heat meaning, we'll say shining of the sun, not really heat, the shining of the sun he, he says, na ambasaha, do not belong to the water. When you look into the surface of water on which uh, the sun is reflected, so you see the shining. Well, first of all, you see the disk of the sun. Is that disk image, does it belong to the water? Clearly not. How about the, the uh, light reflected? by the uh, water. Does that reflection belong to the water? Neither belong to the water. They both belong to the sun. You see where this is going. So s neuroscience wants to attribute knownness to the mind and brain, but that's like attributing <laughs> shining and the visible disk, you see, attributing that to the water, it's another case of false superimposition. Shankara likes that term. He calls it mitya adhyasa, false superimposition. One of the big problems that, uh, that's dealt with in Advaita Vedanta. So this is the drishtanta, the example. Now in the second half comes the Darshtanta, that which is, which is represented by the um, example. He says, in the same way, you see the yata up above, and down below you see tata eva in the last line. In the same manner, buddha first was in the water, jale, now is buddha in the mind. In the mind, bodhaha, here, bodha means consciousness, or even better, knownness, to stay with our current language. So consciousness or knownness, na ta dharmas, is not a dhar, and here dharma, used, the word has so many meanings, and one of the less used, but very important meanings, is quality or attribute. The dharma of water, you say, what, water has dharma? Not in the sense of responsibility. One of the many meanings of dharma is attribute. So water has a unique attribute of having no form of its own, but being able to assume the form of whatever you put the water into. That's a unique attribute. Not many things have that attribute. So that attribute of formlessness, but assuming forms, it is an attribute of water, it is a dharma of water. 
So be ready for that use of dharma, especially in logic, in Indian logic. The word dharma is almost always used in that sense and almost never used in the sense of personal responsibility or punya papa or any of the other meanings. Okay, so the, um, the consciousness or knownness. The knownness of my image arising in your mind right now, he says, it, so it arises buddha in your mind, and Shankara says, it is na tadharmaha. It is, doesn't belong to your mind. Like the light and image of the sun don't belong to the water, not a quality or attribute of the water in the same way consciousness or knownness is not an attribute of your mind. When a scientist says it is an attribute of your mind, they are making the same mistake as if you're saying, look, look at the water is shining. Huh? Water doesn't shine. Mind doesn't produce consciousness. Okay. But he says, Tata Eva, this is so, Syat, this is so, because Vidharmataha, it has a completely different nature. So, Dharma and Vidharma. Dharma is the nature of something, Vidharma is a different nature. So, the sun has a shining nature, water has a different nature. Vidharma. Um, knownness or consciousness has a metaphorically shining nature, revealing nature, whereas mind is the opposite. It is revealed. And here we're back to Vedanta 101, the difference between subject and object, knower and known, revealer and revealed. These are absolutely different. How can, I, I'm, I'm a little bit astonished that, sci that those neuroscientists that claim that consciousness is produced by the brain or mind, why don't they get it, the subject-object? It's such an obvious distinction, very clear from the standpoint of logic, but there are many scientists who aren't interested in using logic. They're interested in using scientific tools and, sci and mathematics. So they overlook that very basic logic. And that is, knower and known are indisputably different. The image of me in your mind is known. The knower of that image of me in your mind is indisputably different. When I say indisputably, because your own experience confirms that. You don't say, you don't say Swamiji's image is known in my mind. <laughs> you don't use that language. You say, I know the image in my mind. I is that awareful subject, which is absolutely different than the image which is known. So the, I call this Vedanta 101. It's one of the most fundamental teachings in Advaita Vedanta, this discernment, the difference between subject and object. Going back to the other, other metaphor, um, going back to Drishtanta, water doesn't shine. Mind is not conscious. That's what the metaphor says. Okay, continuing. <coughs> Chakshur yukta dhyo vrittir Chakshur yukta dhyo vrittir Yatam pasyana lupta drik Yatam pasyana lupta Drik Drishter Drashta Bhavet Atma Drishter Drashta Bhavet Atma Shrute Shrota Tata 
You know, that last word should be bhavet. I, I don't know why it's wrong here. Listen. Shute shrota tata bhavet. Shute shrota tata bhavet. Bhavet means is or would be. We'll come to that in a moment. Back up at the top. The vrittihi, the activity, dhyaha, taking place in your mind, an activity taking place in your mind, in a mind that is chakshur yukta, connected to your eyeballs. I'm being very literal, maybe overly <laughs> literal. <laughs> when your mind is connected to your eyeballs, and your eyes are open and the lights are on, then what happens is an image in this case, an image of me arises in your mind. And in such a case, in such a case, you say, look at the third line. We're going to skip around a little bit. In such a case, you then say that consciousness is the drashta. This is the third line. Consciousness, consciousness is the drashta. The seer, drishte, oh, the word atma is there. Atma, meaning consciousness, bhavet, becomes the drishtehi drashta, the seer of the seen. When my image arises in your mind, because your mind is connected to your eyeballs and the lights are on, in such a situation, you say, I see where the word I indicates Atma, ultimately, right? We've been through this before. The ultimate uh, I is a pronoun. Pronouns stand for what? And if you mix up what the pronoun stands for, you, make, you, get, in you get in big trouble. If you're talking to a male, you shouldn't say she. <laughs> if you're talking to a female, you shouldn't say him. So you have to have the right referent for pronouns. The ultimate meaning of I is not a he or a she. The ultimate meaning of I, as we understand from many prior classes, your essential self as consciousness, as the one who knows whatever is happening in your mind, here simply called Atma. So when that image of mine arises in your mind, a mind that is connected to your eyeballs. Then what? Atma, I, consciousness, bhavet, becomes, seems to become, drishtehe drashta, the seer of the scene. When you say, I see Swamiji. Or better yet, I am the seer of Swamiji. I am a sighted person seeing Swamiji. And the point he's making here is that, is that ya vrittihi tam pashyan, the consciousness that sees, pashyan, the consciousness that sees, ya tam, that vritti, that image of me in your mind, that consciousness is alup. Dric. We've seen that word before. It's a wonderful expression. Shankara likes it and it's, it's used elsewhere. In fact, it comes from Upanishads. Uh, Drik, seer, alupta, the seer that is never lost. Lupta means lost. So right now you see, but that seeing gets lost. Close your eyes for just a moment. What happened to me? <laughs> Lupta. <laughs> go on. <laughs> so, I, in fact, I come and go. Every time you blink your eyes, I momentarily disappear. Your brain does a pretty good job, by the way, of covering up that gap. You can kind of... <laughs> you can tell when your eyes blink. But when your eyes open up again, it's not like you're seeing something brand new. There's a sense of continuity. That sense of continuity is created by your brain. It's pretty good. Which is why you can watch, uh, watch a movie 
in a movie theater, and even though you're watching a sequence of still images, when you're in a movie theater, you're seeing 24 still images projected on the screen every second. 24 images per second. Do you see 24 images? Do you see blinks in between <laughs> those 24 images? So who to be thankful for? Don't thank, I think Edison is one of the founders of, the, of motion pictures or others in, in France who were also involved. But Edison didn't invent this, the function of the motion picture. Your brain fills in the gaps. Your brain allows you to see some constant motion so if you're going to thank anyone, don't thank these inventors. You have to thank Ishvara for giving you a brain that fills in the gaps. And our, our brains fill in many gaps. Let me not get, get off topic here. <coughs> so back to our topic. The observer of the image in your mind doesn't blink. Your eyes blink but the observer doesn't blink. An unblinking observer. Some of you remember I gave an, il gave an illustration that Puja Swamiji gave. He came up with an alupta drik mudra. You all know that, especially in Indian dance. They have all, all these wonderful mudras and their hands are in all these, they do these amazing things with their hands. I think this one is some <laughs> lotus blooming or something. <laughs> what do I know about all, the, all this dance stuff? Nothing. But Puja Swamiji came up with an alupta drik mudra. When, when he showed us, we roared with laughter. He said, alupta drik, and he gave this example. This is the alupta drik mudra, the unblinking <laughs> observer. I still remember when he did that. <coughs> it may have been the first time. This would be in the late 1980s during our, um, our three-year course. I don't know if he ever used that prior to that time. May have. <coughs> anyway, that alupta drik is an unblinking observer and unchanging observer. And what's significant here, coming back to our verse, is that consciousness which right now is the seer of me sitting in this chair, consciousness, you, your essential nature, which is the seer of me sitting in, that ch in this chair, in the last line, tata, in the same way, atma, from the prior line, and that last shutehi should be bhavet. Atma becomes, atma becomes what? Also the same atma becomes the shrota, the hearer of shutehi, of sound. So tell me, do you have to stop seeing my image <laughs> in your mind in order to pay attention to the sound of my words. Is it two different things? Is it that you have a lot of, by the way, there are theories like that, which there are a lot of, in fact, one strange um, theory in neuroscience is one of multiple agents in your brain. Part of your brain is seeing me. Part of your brain is hearing me. And somehow all these individual activities get synced together, get coordinated. This is one of the many, many theories. From Shankara's standpoint, does it mean that the same consciousness, which, which is an observer, becomes a, which is a seer, let me use the right word, the same consciousness, which is a seer, becomes a hearer. Is there a change of condition when you, between seeing me and hearing me, there's no change 
whatsoever because consciousness doesn't change. Unchanging consciousness reveals whatever is in your mind. What is in your mind right now is pretty complicated, but we'll just talk about two, two things that are present in your mind. One thing is the image of me. The other thing is the sound and meaning of my words. By the way, notice there are two different things, sound and meaning. If you didn't know English, <laughs> The sound would certainly be present in your mind, but the meaning wouldn't be. You, you follow my English fine, so the sound and meaning are present in your mind. Both are simultaneously revealed by one alupta drik, one unblinking, unchanging consciousness. Now, the significance of that We'll see in the next verse. <laughs> Want to build up the excitement here. <laughs> As it, uh, not that this is so exciting. It's not like, a, not like a Bollywood movie. You're waiting to see where the plot goes. <laughs> I don't think there's much of a plot here, at, le at least not in a dramatic sense. Okay, continuing. Are we doing time yet? Kevalam manaso vrittam, Kevalam manaso vrittam, Pashyan manta matera jaha, Pashyan manta matera jaha, Vignata lupta shakti twat, Vignata lupta shakti twat, Tata shastram nahi hiataha. Tathashastram nahiyataha. So, prior verse we talked about Atma as seer of forms, Atma as hearer of sounds. Now, what about Atma as knower of thoughts, which is what we have here. So, the same vrittim. Uh, manasaha vrittim, kevala manasaha vrittim pashyan. I have to connect a lot of words here. When there is an activity, vritti, don't lose, you know, we use it for thought, but the root meaning is actually that which moves. It refers to a mental activity, and I like that translation quite a bit, even though it's usually translated as thought. So this vritti, this activity of the manasaha, of the mind, kevalam, with regard to that alone, the observation of thoughts in your mind. Right now you're having the thought, where is this discussion going? <laughs> where is Shankara going with this? And this is good to have that thought. So um, when, when that thought is present in your mind, and ajaha pashyan, ajaha literally means unborn, referring to that alukta trick that unchanging consciousness. We'll see that in the next line. So that consciousness, Atma, Pashyan, as the observer of thoughts in your mind, not an image, not sounds, but uh, the observer of a thought, that Atma becomes the Manta, the thinker, mat Matehe, of thoughts. So putting this together with the prior line, prior verse, just as Atma takes the role of seer of images, Atma takes the role of hearer of sounds, Atma takes the role of thinker of thoughts, that suggests that Atma changes, that consciousness changes. But that consciousness is unchanging. What changes is the activities of your mind. 
unchanging observer of the activities of your mind that such a powerful and clear expression of the truth of your experience right now. You are the un you in your essential nature as consciousness. You are the unchanging observer of changing conditions of your mind. But as clear and as powerful as that is, we don't seem to get it. When you say, and give some good examples now, when you say, I am nearsighted, consciousness is nearsighted. <laughs> so that I, which is supposed to be a pronoun ref referring to Atma, you connect it up with your eyeballs. When you say, I am hard of hearing, you're connecting it with your ears. But we use that in language all the time. When you, when you say, I am, huh, I am drowsy. How, how about I give a more pertinent example? I am dizzy, which is <laughs> usually the case nowadays. <laughs> So you say, I am dizzy. Consciousness says, what do you say in Hindi? Chakar ho gaya? Consciousness doesn't get, look at this. How do you know if you're dizzy? Dizziness is known to unchanging consciousness. Thoughts are known to unchanging consciousness. The condition of your eyes and ears and all of your senses are known to the unchanging consciousness. Um, I said before, drowsiness. People say, I wake up in the morning, my consciousness is so dull. After a cup of coffee, 100 watts, <laughs> shining brightly. How do you know that? How do you know that there was dullness followed by brightness? The dullness and brightness were revealed by unchanging consciousness. The dullness and brightness belong to your mind. When you say that I, I dreamt last night, or I had some dreamless sleep last night, consciousness doesn't dream. Consciousness doesn't sleep. Consciousness doesn't wake up in a literal or figurative meaning. The figurative meaning enlightenment. Consciousness doesn't get enlightened. Consciousness is a trick, the unchanging, unblinking observer of whatever happens in your mind. And Shankara's intention here is to show the problem of identification. So, with that in mind, he says, none of this is true for consciousness. Why? Third line, vignata alupta shakti twat. Because the vignata, the, the knower, which here meaning pure consciousness, possesses alupta shakti, this uninterrupted, unchanging shakti power. But here, power of what? Power of revealing, power of knowing, power of making the activities of your mind known to you. We're back to that knownness, atma, consciousness. Your true self is the source of knownness. Tata shastram, just as it says in the scripture, nahi iti ataha, in the brihad aranyaka upanishad. One of the most powerful, powerful sections, we studied these sections uh, years ago, 
you can find the uh, audio recordings on our website. Uh, one of the most powerful statements uh, that he's just quoting these two words, nahi, the full statement, nahi drashtuhu drashtehe vipari lopaha. For the drash, for the seer, there is no vilopa, we saw before lupta and vilopa, same meaning. There is no loss of drishtehe, of sight. For the seer, there's no loss of sight. Notice that when you close your eyes, loss of sight. Like I said before, I become lupta. <laughs> Taratmananda lopa, the loss of... Huh. Lopa is also destruction. <laughs> In terms of your experience, every time you close your eyes, you destroy me. In the sense that you destroy that image of me arising in your mind. But that image that comes and goes is utterly different from the consciousness, which doesn't come and go, being a loop duh. Okay, this introduces the next verse. We'll see, we'll see one more verse here. Okay. Dhyayati, huh? Dhyayati tyavikaritvam, Dhyayati tyavikaritvam, Tata le layati tyapi, Tata le layati tyapi, Atraste ne tishuddhatvam, Atraste ne tishuddhatvam, Tatanyan, huh? Tatanan vagatam shutehe, Tatahan vagatam shutehe, Tata an avagatam, an avagatam. Okay. So Shankara continues this, uh, uh, in fact, the same passage from this wonderful Brihararanika, this chapter four is one of the spectacular chapters in the Brihadaranyaka um, Upanishad. He makes another quote. Uh, it says, Dhyayati eva lelayati eva, referring to consciousness. He says, sometimes consciousness dhyayati seems to uh, here become quiet. Sometimes consciousness seems to be quiet, and sometimes leilayati. Sometimes it seems to be active, jumping around. Certainly true of your mind. Sometimes the mind is quiet, especially in deep sleep or in meditation, as the word suggests. But most often when you're awake, the mind is quite active. It's the mind that is active or quiet, and what about consciousness? This argument for the unchanging nature of consciousness is so important. I've made this, this argument many times, and some people object to it. And I think it, it's absolutely a sound argument, and it's given by Shankara also in other places. Here, here's the idea of, of, the, um, of the argument. If your mind becomes agitated and consciousness simultaneously becomes agitated, how will you know that the presence of agitation? If the observed and observer change in identical ways, how can you observe? The metaphor I've given all the time is you're driving in a car at 60 miles an hour and you look across, you look over your shoulder and there's another person sitting stationary in his car from your standpoint, sitting stationary in his car. Of course, he's also going 60 miles an hour. In order to see him move 60 miles an hour, you have to be an unchanging observer on the side of the road. By the way, the, I keep thinking of uh, Einstein, who used to live down the road here in Princeton. Um, this is one of the parts of his 
principle of general <laughs> relativity. Everything depends on your frame of reference. If your frame of reference is going 60 miles an hour, from that frame of reference there's no motion. If the frame of reference of consciousness, if consciousness's frame of reference is constantly changing according to the changes of the mind, how will you perceive changes in the mind? The agitation of the mind, when viewed by an agitated consciousness, how will you tell? Can you, and how will you tell whether the agitation belongs to the mind or to consciousness? It's all indistinguishable. It's all massive confusion. On the other hand, when you take consciousness as being the unchanging, unblinking, a loop de drick, observer of the mind, all of these problems are solved. That's why uh, that word comes eva in the scripture, as though. The uh, consciousness seems to get agitated. Consciousness seems to become quiet. But in fact, consciousness is unchanging. Why? Avikaditvam. Because of the unchanging nature of consciousness. So if Shankara is in the mood here for this Burhadaranyaka Upanishad, I sometimes wonder. Um, he, some, he gets into a, a, a groove, so to speak, of quoting one scripture again and again and again, but different scriptures, depending on where in this text. And it makes me wonder if when he wrote these verses, maybe he was had an ongoing class on Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. I like to imagine that because that's how teachers work. Whatever you're teaching in one class kind of bleeds over <laughs> into other classes. That happens to me all the time. In fact, sometimes, as you know, I sometimes get confused about what class I'm teaching. <laughs> So I don't think Shankara had that problem. I might have that problem from time to time. Anyway, so he continues to quote from this Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. He says, Atra, there, uh, with regard to Atma, there is Shuddhatvam, purity of Atma, as shown by the, uh, uh, the scriptural statement, Stena iti. St what a funny example he uses. Stena means thief. The Brihada Ranyaka Upanishad makes this quotation about a thief. And the, the, the fuller quotation is consciousness doesn't itself take on different roles. <coughs> if consciousness is present in a father, I'm paraphrasing the Upanishad now, does consciousness become father? No. If consciousness is present in a mother, does consciousness become mother? No. If consciousness is present in a thief, <laughs> there's the example, does consciousness become a thief? No. Therefore, shuddhatvam, consciousness is independent of all these changing roles. And he gives one more example. Tata un Un unvagatam, unvagatam, meaning getting associated. Un unvagatam, not getting associated, remaining detached. Shutehe, according to the scripture, according to this passage in Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, consciousness, the true self, is un 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 Anvagatam, I have a problem separating these words in my mind. Consciousness doesn't get associated, and then in context it goes on to say, doesn't get associated with punya and papa, so called uh, sin and, and merit. In that sense, consciousness is shuddha. Shuddha pure really goes along with. Cha with unchanging, and we'll, we'll end with this observation. That which is unchanging 
is necessarily pure because, watch the logic, in order to become impure, it has to undergo a change. To go from a state of purity to a state of impurity is a state of change. Therefore, that which is unchanging, consciousness, is eternally pure. Pure in the sense, utterly unaffected by whatever happens to the body and mind. Okay, that's a good place to conclude. A lot of uh, wonderful teachings will continue <coughs> next week. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagavit Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor ma amritangamaya om shanti 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 om tat sat. <laughs>